Usually when we're building with this molecule kit, we're letting black stand for carbon. And there's a good reason for that because, well, a lot of things that contain carbon are black, but also carbon has four holes and this black sphere has four holes. And that represents the four places that carbon wants to make a bond because of its electron structure. Carbon has four electrons in its outer shell and so that means it has four empty places and it can make four bonds. So the holes represent where it can make a bond. So we often make this, which is CH4, carbon bonded to four hydrogens. Carbon just somehow likes to bond to hydrogens. It works out really well. So that is a methane or natural gas molecule. But we can also let the black represent silicon because silicon has the same electron configuration that carbon does. Silicon is in the same column on the periodic table and that means that it also has four electrons in its outer shell. Now it has a few more in its inner shells, but four in the outer shell. So that means it has four places, or four empty places, that it would like to form a bond. So we can also use this four hole black circle to represent silicon. Now silicon doesn't really naturally bond to the hydrogens the way carbon does. Silicon would rather bond to these red things which are representing oxygen. Now oxygen would like to make two bonds. It has six electrons in its outer shell so it's two empty places. So this red bead is really good for that because it has two holes. So oxygen will form a bond with the silicon and then it'll still have one open. You see each of these still have a place where it can bond and that's going to be very significant in how these minerals form. If you imagine that there's a plane across here, you see how this kind of forms a triangle, you could make a shape like this if you really simplified this. You can make a tetrahedral pyramid like this. So oftentimes you'll see the silicon tetrahedron, which is the basic building block of the silicate minerals, you'll see it represented as a tetrahedron like this. Now the black carbon would be in the middle, right? And the red things would be at the corners. But you'll just see this triangular shape and you have to know what it is. You have to know that it's really this. It's a silicon bonded to four oxygens. Now I can switch back and forth and use this model or this model. These are the same thing. It's very important to know that this paper triangle thing is exactly the same as this. This is representing the same thing. So sometimes it's going to be easier to use the little paper triangles and sometimes I'm going to want to show you how they attach and we'll use this. But it's important to know that it's the same thing. Okay. So let's switch over to our paper tetrahedrons. And let's say we've got some hot magma that's got a lot of silicon in it. Now this would be SiO4, right? One silicon and four oxygens. Each one of these would be SiO4. So the whole mix is going to have a chemical formula of SiO4. So these are swirling around and moving in the hot magma. I'm not going to move them around because that would make too much chaos. And also in the area are some other atoms. Now, I'm not going to exactly define what each color represents because there could be some, there's definitely iron and magnesium. There could also be some sodium, potassium, maybe some aluminum. So we've got these extra elements floating around and they're kind of unattached also. And it just so happens that, see, they have holes too. So they would like to form bonds, but they're metals. And they're not going to bond with silicon in the same way that we have here. Only oxygen and silicon are going to do this. This gray thing here represents a covalent bond, which is very, very strong. This is a little shape that's going to stick together like this. See, they're all sticking together. 
So these are going to form ionic bonds with the little tetrahedrons. So the remember there's holes still here, okay? So these oxygens would like to kind of bond with something. So they're going to bond with these guys because these guys have holes. They would like to also. And this especially happens with iron and magnesium. Iron is very happy to come over and kind of be attracted to these two. So you can imagine there's attractions going on here. This one is being attracted here. This one's being attracted here. Okay. So there are electrical attractions holding these things together. Now they're still free to move around when the magma is really hot. But if we cool it quickly and like freeze all these guys in place, just as they are right now, it's like you have a bunch of hot vegetable soup and you put it in the a cold freezer, like outside if it's below zero, and you chill that pot down very quickly and you could maintain this look. In essence, what you would have is frozen soup. You'd have stone soup with all these little individual bits frozen in place. And this is exactly what happens in the mineral called olivine. There's some samples of pure, fairly pure olivine. When olivine is doesn't have anything else mixed with it, it's green and transparent. You might think it's like a green type of quartz. And of course, there's a good reason for that because there's so much silicon. Things that contain a lot of silicon are often clear or almost clear, nice and shiny and glassy. Silicon makes things glassy. But in fact, the olivine has a significantly different structure to it than quartz does, as we'll see. So this is the structure here of olivine. And if you remember olivine, olives, you like to eat olives. Well, I don't like to eat olives, but a lot of people do. They're edible, though. So when you think olivine, think of something edible and think of stone soup. Think of this scenario for olivine, soup. So what would happen if we let the soup cool down a little more slowly and we allowed these pyramids to interact with each other? What would happen? Well, remember those holes, those oxygens there, right? They want to make bonds. What might happen is this. If we take off one of those, we could go like this. And we could do that again with another one and hook on. And the pyramids could kind of string together like this. And in fact, this does happen. We kind of move our pyramids, like put them in little lines here like this. The first thing that happens is they start to line up. And they form strings. Now we will go and make them like that. Now these are still here, working in the spaces. We still have some of the extra atoms, and usually we do still have a lot of iron and magnesium here. And so we're still going to get this attraction because, like, these guys aren't bonded, and this guy, remember, there's a an oxygen sticking out here, right? Every one of these points has an oxygen on it. So we still have oxygens that are kind of unhappy and looking for bonds, and so they'll be attracted to these things. And so these are like the stabilizers are going to keep the lines in place. Otherwise, maybe these would be like floppy spaghetti noodles. So you could kind of think this is noodle soup if you make the noodles like long spaghetti. So it's like spaghetti soup. And if we freeze it, this is what we'll see. We'll see these long lines of silicon tetrahedrons and these iron and magnesium and some other elements in between. And what we've made here is called the pyroxene family of silicates. The pyroxenes have these long lines of tetrahedrons. 
so what do these guys look like? Well, one of them is called diopside, one of them is called augite, one of them is called jadeite. And these two still look green. You know how olivine was green? These two still look green. Now jadeite, once it gets carved, they call it jade. But you can't tell by looking, can you, that it has these long lines of triangles. Even a microscope, you wouldn't be able to see them. So what happens next? Well, if we let these guys have a little more time to arrange themselves, these little tetrahedrons are going to want to join together. These two lines will go together to make a double line like this. Six of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, will get together like that. And then you'll get another six going together like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. And you get another kind of like this. And that's what you see in this picture. Two lines are joining together to make a double. So you got a double chain and a double chain. These used to be four individual chains, and now you have two double chains. Now these guys don't look green. Right, this is hornblende, which looks black and very boring. And then you've got asbestos. So these actually do show up in the structure of the mineral. This is what makes them fibrous, like asbestos look little has little fibers. Well, it's all these long lines of little silicon tetrahedrons all lined up. The single chains were a little too loose. They didn't really do much damage, but these double chains are a lot stiffer and they can cause problems in the little bits of asbestos that they get in your lungs. They poke and jab and irritate your cells. They're like little needles going into your lung cells all the time. Now, of course, we still have these guys all floating in the area, keeping the double chains together into a solid rock. Well, what happens if we let these silicon tetrahedrons get even more organized? What they're going to do next is form a sheet. You'll get a whole bunch of these together. and I don't have enough tetrahedrons to make it, but it's going to look something like that. And that's when we get our micas. The black ones are called biotite, and the clear ones are called muscovite. And these peel very easily. See, that's just I could just peel one of these sheets right off. I'm not going to because I don't want to ruin my specimen. But the reason that these are so peely is because it has these sheets of little silicon tetrahedras in there. Now, these guys are still around. What these are going to do is kind of go in, if you can imagine, if I could suspend these, these are going to go in and... Uh, stay in between the sheets. It's kind of like if you have cheese and you put like wax paper or foil or something between the sheets so they don't sit together. So these are all going to be floating in between the sheets. And then there'll be another stack of white white triangles on top of this and another layer of these. Or maybe like a lasagna where these are the noodles and this, the beads here they are like the sauce. The little extra would be um, a lot of potassium and sodium, maybe a little bit of iron and magnesium, but mainly by the time you get to this, the iron and the magnesium is gone. The pyroxenes and the um, olivine formed, and it used up all the iron and magnesium apparently, and you're left with mostly just silicon and some potassium and aluminum and sodium, and so that's what would be kind of lubricating, especially potassium in between the uh, layers. So you've got silicon noodles and potassium sauce in a lasagna. And of course the reason it's shiny is because of the silicon. So if you give these tetrahedrons a lot of time to get organized, they are going to start making some really cool geometries. Every single one of these points is going to join to something else. Forget all of these. They don't need any of these to keep them together anymore. They will all hook up like this. They'll start forming. Now I'd start another layer on top of here. And they build a whole little 
structure just of tetrahedrons. So I just started one here to show how it's going to be nice and solid. No slipping around. It doesn't need any extra ions to keep it together. And of course this is called the framework. Like a, like a building when you see a big tall building being built and they put all those steel I-beams in as a framework and then they put the brick and stuff on the outside of that. So this is like the framework. So this is called a framework silicate. It's very strong and it doesn't need any extra ions to keep it together. It can be just pure silicon and oxygen. Now, if you add up how many blacks there are, if I had a really big framework structure here, and I added up all the blacks and all the reds, the blacks are silicon and the reds are oxygen, I would find out that my proportion is that I have about twice as many reds as I do blacks. That's just how it works out. So for every one silicon, I have two oxygens because they're like sharing. See this black one that's sharing? They don't each have their own red. This one is being shared. So that's why the formula for quartz is SiO2, not SiO4. Even though these are SiO4, this is SiO2 because they're sharing so many of the oxygens. And of course, anything that's made of quartz will have that same SiO2 formula. Glass, chert, jasper, chalcedony, all of those are basically made of this. So they're going to have that SiO2. Except that the crystals are going to be small. When you get to those cryptosilicates, maybe a crystal might only be this big. Now in a nice big quartz crystal, the kind you can really hold in your hand, it's got those six sides, it looks like glass, there would be things like if this were in scale you might have one of these that's like from here to the moon large so this is very small this is atoms and molecules so probably in the crypto silicates maybe that maybe a little bit bigger but you have little tiny crystals like this just little bits of framework